a lot of things can happen, and they might not be pretty things. Um, how do you weigh the risks and benefits? Uh, they're not mine to weigh right now. I mean, we have these conversations in the democracy schools, but it's really about taking, a, in some ways, it's doing a home rule study commission analysis on the current constitution, you know, which is what we're going through with some municipalities. What are the things currently embedded within the state and federal constitutions that prevent us from actually having functioning, sustainable, rights protecting communities? What are the things in the way? And so that was some of the stuff that I outlined at the beginning state and federal preemptive law the corporate constitutional rights, um, regulatory stuff, which gets in the way of meaningful community self-governance. Um, there's a number of issues like that that we have identified with communities over the years. Um, you know, and what's the process going to be for opening it up? I don't know. Uh, you know, right now, the only actual process on the books for changing the Pennsylvania Constitution is through the state legislature. Right. Uh, there's not actually a, a citizen's uh, change mechanism. So uh, we have communities that are talking about that. What would a, a different mechanism look like and how are we gonna get there? How are we gonna make it democratic? How do we involve a number of people? Um, yeah, there's potential negative consequences to opening that up. Um, I think for a lot of the communities that I'm working with though, the potential negative consequences don't outweigh the existing consequences which are currently forcing a lot of nasty stuff on them that they don't want. And so they're saying, you know, uh, what do we have to lose? And in the, in the uh, you know, legacy of the other civil rights movements in this country we recognize right now our rights are being violated and we have to do something to reclaim them. But isn't it possible that we could lose the environmental protections we have now in our state constitution if you open up the state constitution and you allow the legislature to be the ones who decide? I guess it's possible. I, I mean, I have a hard time believing that the existing environmental protections could get much worse. Um, exactly. but, well, they stopped the Shaheen Well site for now, and I will see whether that appeal is upheld. And my other question is that I've been told that if a community tries to enact an outright ban on fracking in Pennsylvania, and that's challenged by one of the energy companies that wants to put a project in a place where you specifically prohibit it from being, and that challenge is upheld by the court and the municipality loses, that then drilling or associated activity can happen anywhere in that municipality because of the way the state statutes are written. I was told that by a lawyer. So um, I guess my concern would be that if we in our municipalities work to try to use some of these tools that you're offering, um, that we would have, and I realize that you're trying to cover, and you are covering a great deal amount of ground in a short time period, and I appreciate that um, very much. You've given us a lot of information. But I would think that a really detailed analysis of the risks, the potential risks, uh, and potential downsides, as well as any potential benefits, would have to be part of this process. It's the community group's decision, whoever's going to do, you know, whatever yeah, that's what they want to do. Is that so. sell death's obligation, is my question, is to make municipalities aware of all the potential risks and downsides as well yeah. as the potential benefits if we call any of these courses of action. Uh, every potential risk and downside, I don't think we could probably do that. But, uh, I mean, look, I mean, we, So, yeah, I mean, and I'm always very clear. I mean, I think I've been very clear with potential consequences in this presentation tonight, which is, first of all, I'm not here to encourage you to do one thing or another. What you know, other And I've been very clear that the risks include likely getting sued, um, which is scary in rural poor municipalities. Could include potential bankruptcy. Could include putting you on the receiving end of nasty stuff from the state or other corporations. Other communities are talking about it actually including them getting in the streets. So, you know, I mean, I don't know what, uh, you know, other consequences, but those are the things that I think I've been pretty clear about mm -hmm. and am with every community that we work with and letting them know that this isn't the silver bullet. Um, but also that unless you challenge something, it's very likely that at some point you're going to get what you don't want or at least a version of it. And then, you know, folks need to decide what the best way forward for their community is. Well, I, I, I also think that there, there's a, um, I mean, any, you, the community would, you know, could define the risks themselves. Chad could do that, I could do that. But it, then it comes down to quantifying the risks. Um, you know, there are certainly potential risks. The, the community has to decide which, you know, <coughs> How much do they want to risk, and what are they going to? What are they risking if they do nothing? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really, it's not, it's, it's not the amount of risk or what those risks are. 
you know, how they're quantified. Well, I say it's, it's how much, what is the, your home and, and your community worth to you? I mean, how much is it worth to you? And that you can't put a dollar on it. You cannot put a, a dollar cost on the value of Plunkett's Creek Township nor the Lowell Sock Valley. I mean, you know, I mean, to me, it's worth everything and more. It's not a question of how much it's worth. It's a question of being fully informed about all the potential uh, I, I consequences. About risks. I know. Consequences. So yeah. that we, if we do to make these decisions, we're making them fully informed. But I, but I think you're putting way too much pressure on, on the organization and, and realizing that they are giving us the tools to, to become our own governing entity. That's what, we're, that's what the goal is, to go from, from being a second-class municipality, which you come under all their zoning, all their statutes, everything. You become your own governing municipality, which would be Plunkett's Creek Township. And then it's all the people. And, and, you know, I mean, that, then you work together to figure out what, what's worth it. What are we willing to sacrifice? So, you know, can we get a fund of money and, and, and you know, have a, a, you know, I mean, I mean, how much are we going to challenge it? But a lot of the things that they're helping you to organize are cost, almost, co you know, cost free. I mean, the first couple of things that we... I'm not worried about dollars and cents. I'm worried about I'm, uh, ramifications, unforeseen consequences i understand that that could put us in a worse position than we are now but i don't think they're in a position to tell you what the, no, you know, that is but i mean I, are they are, are we risking losing our rights to clean air and, and clean water are we going to risk losing that amendment to, to our state constitution boy i sure hope not i, right. <laughs> I mean but boy are we really going to go backwards that way a question as well. do you have any gauge of taking a pulse of a community on which way they would go if presented with the home rule option. Yeah, I mean, that seems to me to be the big question. If you want to go down this road, where is your township when the votes come? You know, where, where are they, they going to go? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that would be traditional campaign Boy, tactics, yeah. phone banking, and things like that, holding big public meetings to engage the pulse of whoever's coming out, you know, as so many people you can get out, educate them, and see what they think about it. Um, you know, a common tactic that other communities use is pushing the ordinance first, trying to get their supervisors to pass the ordinance, recognizing that the supervisors probably aren't going to pass the ordinance, and then that process itself actually brings about the reason for why they should pursue a home rule. So it's a longer educational process that provides the reasons for the community to understand how the system is currently set up to not give people the voice that they want in the community and how even their own elected officials are selling them out despite what the people in the community want. So that's a longer process. That's one way to do it, but it just takes more time. So, but short answer, I mean, outside of talking to people individually and getting on the phone and holding the, the public meetings, uh, there's not a really good way to gauge it, especially because a lot of folks, I mean, home rule doesn't, you know, doesn't just hang in your brain. And it usually elicits a lot of blank stares when you say it the first time. And you have to hit people a bunch of times with you know the reasons why and what it actually means and what it is and what it's not uh, in order for that to get through. So um, you know, even I think taking a, an initial poll of people on the phone, uh, if you ask them, but then you talk with them a number of times over a series of months, it could be a very different conversation. So I think it's hard to say what people would think about it when you talk with them initially versus what it would mean after you educate the community over a number of months. Can I ask how long Philadelphia Company has been a home rule county? They were early 70s, but I don't know. What does that mean? It's a huge city. Yeah, and it's a county of its own, like a city and a county. It's, I mean, it's, the, it's got its own city code as well. It's the only first class city in Pennsylvania. So it's got its own legal governing structure, separate from every other municipality. Have you seen, I guess, when you go into these communities, is it more community groups that are kind of spontaneously forming, or are there existing community groups that you can up in communities? Uh, the majority of folks we work with are new community groups that have formed in response to a specific harm. So a lot of it's first-time activists, first-time people that never took an interest in anything, and they finally just said that they had enough. Um, a lot of existing groups 
um, especially groups that have been institutionalized over the years and that get funding and things from other sources and have other mission statements are less likely to do the work um, if they already have a, a focus and you're know, used to working with a specific uh, type of structure. So the vast majority of people work with everything. Uh, can you give a sense on how many municipalities that are instituting home rule are doing so, and I don't know how to say how, how many, like a percentage or whatever, as a result of some huge environmental issue in their municipality. So as a result of that, everybody's banding together and they want to institute rule. And also there's a difference between sludge or a pipeline that a lot of people would not benefit from versus when I'm really getting nice yeah, um, I mean, just say it's not like dozens of communities pursuing home rule, at least that I know of this year. You know, there's, it's a new project area and there's more going this year than we've had in a while, but it's not like 20 or 30, so it's not a huge groundswell uh, in that sense. Um, the discussion around fracking and royalties and, you know, when people are actually benefiting uh, financially from the activity, yeah, it's a, it's a harder discussion between the community. It's definitely a much different discussion than you know, sludge when the vast majority of people are against it. So um, that's a, a real, you know, obstacle in the fracking community is getting some things done sometimes um, because it can get very divisive. Um, you know, some communities do so pass stuff against fracking, but it's a harder conversation, I think, than sludge to be sure. And that's comes back to me, the best definition of organizing I ever heard was first you talk to one person, then you talk to another, and then you talk to another, and <laughs> realize that it's, you know, pretty long-term stuff. But um, uh, I have seen the tide shifting against uh, drilling in Pennsylvania in some ways that I haven't seen in a while, particularly in Northwest PA, uh, where I think drilling is probably about to pick up. But people up there, uh, I don't know how much they're going to act, but are definitely, I think, more concerned than a lot of folks were in uh, Southwest PA and Northeast PA, where, you know, the, the way highway kind of hit before people were leaving new. A lot of folks in Northwest PA have seen the negative impacts associated with the drill and have taken, I think, a much closer look at it, more critical look, and maybe willing to, to act uh, up there. So it's not to say that uh, attitudes don't change over time, but that's a harder discussion for sure. Our township has a very large proportion of state-owned land. Um, how does that change the dynamic, do you think? Have you encountered that in other places where you think um, not from our perspective, it doesn't change. I mean, whatever would be in the municipal boundary, we did a right space, the folks would be folks would be protected. Um, so we wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily be trying to help have any greater say over what happens on the state lands in the municipality because that state land would be working with everything else. We'd be working with the state lands that's contained within the municipality and everything else. So basically, if, you know, if there's a municipal boundary, whether it's state land or municipal land or private land or whatever like that, um, stuff that we work with folks on is to pass a blank prohibition in all areas of the municipal boundary, whether it's state or local or whatever. That Seriously. Would the project. Seriously. So, like, for example, in our township, there's a, there's lots of 3,000 acres of it is leased. It's a state forest, it's leased. But it's within our township boundary. So you're saying that you believe you would be able to help municipalities have some say over what happens on that state-owned land, even because it's within that municipality? Uh, that's the argument we would make in ordinance. That's the community wanted. Have you tried that anywhere? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's uh, a it's... number of communities in Pennsylvania. I mean, in New Mexico, there's state land and all sorts of private land stuff that was leased. Um, Ohio, right now, the existing litigation as well um, has, you know, private and local and municipal and other types of land. And basically, it's saying that uh, if it's contained within the municipality, and the municipality is the community, that if it's harmful to one person in there, it's harmful to everybody, and therefore there's going to be a prohibition on the activity in all parts of the municipality. Yeah. That we're not about moving it, or we're not, a, you know, we don't really recognize that there's a difference between state land or private land if what's going to be done on that land is going to be violating other people's rights. There's not a difference in who owns the land if the activity that's going to take place on that land would be in violation of other people's rights. Very um, with the uh, again with the home rule charter, have you seen that they go through the process and when it's time to adopt their their rules, that they keep more or less what's already in place and just change a couple hot topic items? They don't reinvent the wheel, or do you essentially reinvent the wheel? 
that's up to the people on the study commission uh, to decide what they want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have done a draft charter that would basically be about keeping everything the same within the second class township or whatever it is, keep the board of supervisors the same, election terms the same, basically default to the second class township code as the governing document, but then just add in, you know, the particular features you want, like initiative and referendum and recall, and then the rights that you wanted in the specific prohibitions that you want to put in there, but keep everything else pretty much the same, so business as usual will essentially carry on. And that's when you would need your citizens group to be the party if then the supervisors then would then change. Yeah, and we also, I mean, in stuff that we do, whether it's an ordinance or, you know, if we work with people to write a, a charter, um, put in citizen enforcement provisions so that if the elected officials basically sell out their duty to the community, that there are enforcement provisions for citizens groups to take action. But a community like the first case of Plunkett's Creek is thinking somewhat seriously about getting into home rule. Would you or someone who tell that to be available to come Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if you're thinking for this year, it would obviously need to move quickly. Um, and it would probably mean the next step would be a phone call with the seven or nine people that you have that are committed to doing this. And we would work with everybody on the same page and go through a lot of the worst case scenarios and you know what's what this actually means. And then be uh, more deeply uh, familiar with our work as well. Because you know, looking at some of our ordinances or things like that, folks may not actually agree with everything. Folks may not agree with some things. So, um, and that's obviously fine. I, I don't know. The, uh, what I'm saying, but you know, this is really these are tools that can be utilized with or without us. You know, we have some history and we can understand the process around them. But not everybody has, you know, there's certain things that um, if people wanted to do a, a bill of rights or an ordinance that allowed uh, zoning for the pipeline or something like that, which is not something we'd be interested in. We would do it doesn't mean you folks couldn't do it on your own. But yeah, if uh, folks wanted to work with us, the next step, you know, would be to get on a phone call with the serious folks, talk to the stuff people, talk more about our work, and see if there's uh, overlap. How, how much assistance do you give with communities when they, you know, we'll, we would have a mixed bag because we already have uh, existing wells and probably and there are probably some pipeline already in the township. And I assume those would be grad, uh, grandfathered in. Or how how would you how would how do you recommend dealing with existing infrastructure? Yeah, it's up to you, folks. It depends on how much you want to fight. Um, you know, if you wanted to say we're going to prohibit all drilling, including existing stuff. You know, we'd have to have a serious conversation with you folks. That wouldn't happen. I know. That. But to your point, you know, we have done that in other places where they grandfathered in ex existing infrastructure and just yeah. prohibited all new stuff. Okay. So that would be a, essentially the conversation, whether it's with the charter and ordinance, is us, you know, working together to figure out your priorities, what your right. goals are, what it is you want to see, um, and if uh, your goals are, you know, in alignment with our mission type of uh, assistance we provide, then work together and if you want to go in a different direction I'm just here for you. I know what direction I want to go. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah just this is it might be minor. I've been working in communication so I'm very very uh conscious of spin and disclaimer so I understand the reasons for it but I guess it kind of bothers me that the, the website has a disclaimer that specifically says this is not intended as legal advice um, or to be deemed to be the offering of legal services and not present as advocacy in support of or opposition to particular legislation. Last part, I understand. But you're not to be deemed to be offering of legal services, but yet what you're holding out for us is, well, if this works for you and it works for us and our missions are aligned and we help you, then we'll provide legal services. So how are you not offering legal services? I mean, everything that's available on our website is, you know, can be used by people in their own capacity. Whether it's home rule, whether it's writing an ordinance that looks like ours, um, you know, most of the stuff is there for educational purposes. And so it's providing our history and our experience working with municipal and community based law in Pennsylvania and across the country, um, you know, with the intention that uh, communities should have the authority to determine their own future. I mean, that's our mission statement. So it's not legal services giving you advice saying this is what you should or shouldn't do. I think that's my definition of legal services is giving you an opinion on what you should or shouldn't do. 
those materials are there to provide perspective on what they're doing <laughs> and, uh, and what we can do. I know that's on the website itself, but this essentially, though, if if, if people do go forward in this uh, uh, manner and CELDEP is intimately involved in helping the municipality or the community group or both do that, and it's challenged and they get sued, you're saying that CELDEP provides the legal services pro bono to help defend against those suits. So you say so. Your disclaimer isn't saying that CELDEP does not provide legal services. It's just saying that this website is not to be interpreted that way, right? Yes. So I mean, if you know, a community group wanted to work with us, in addition to the phone call, they would also need to sign what's called an engagement letter. So this isn't a, a contract. It just basically says we, this community group, um, you know, understand that we are not going to lobby for you or run your campaign. Um, and you know, other things of that nature is the disclaimers. Um, and it also says, you know, if an ordinance that you pass that we draft with you is challenged in court, um, we may be retained, and that we would assert new and creative uh, theories of law in order to help your community, uh, you know, defend the ordinance. So we're pretty clear about that stuff. Um, but those aren't legal services. But we were to be retained, you know, the legal services that we provide at that point would be protected under attorney-client privilege, whether it's with the community group or with the supervisors. And it would be for us to aggressively defend the ordinance as much as possible to protect the community's rights before we follow that same. Um, but it's not an open, you know, like legal process at that point. We're you know, dumping strategy around on the internet. You know, it's a, it's a legal fight at that point. But we got going on in Grant Township. We have a relationship with the supervisor and the community group to do the legal stuff. And that's all protected and it's important. Um, but they retained us under separate agreements. Um, and they knew what that was going to be moving forward when they drafted the law. Because the drafting process itself takes time. You know, it's usually couple of weeks, if not months, if not, I've been doing drafting with community groups for a year or two. They can change their mind and come back and then they go away for a while and do other stuff. And just so like, you know, this is not a, a cut and dry process. I think it probably sounds like that more tonight because I gave the home rule stuff and those are some pretty specific guidelines, and timelines, and definitions. Um, but the overall process that generally follows the community is that we work with is very organic and it's a, a relationship building process. But the legal services, um, yeah, I don't think that's something. I'm sorry, what's on website? Uh, I don't see the stuff on our website as legal services at all. No, I didn't mean what was on your website. I was wondering whether the dis disclaimer was saying that CELDEP does not provide legal services. And what you're saying is you are licensed to practice law if somebody wants to retain you. The disclaimer was, what, was my just, disclaimer or? The disclaimer on your website is only about the website itself, not the organization as a whole. Okay, thanks. That's why I wanted to understand. Very cool. Well, no, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I passed out um, the agendas and I had some emails yes, that I need. I have them right here. Today. Thank you. Um, so, quick, I'm just going to.